Okay, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the Advanced Topics webinar of the Coastal Modeling System. This is the last day of the webinar. Um, thanks for attending. Um, yesterday we left off talking about advanced output options, um, the simulation statistics, uh, outputting uh, different variable groups into different files, and uh, XMDF file compression and various other things. Today what we're going to start off talking about is scripting. This is um, how to set up multiple cases or, or uh, alternatives for projects efficiently and running them uh, quickly and plotting them. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about problem solving um, and model calibration. I'll show some examples of how the model was calibrated for different projects. Um, rather than uh, doing the hands-on of how to click this and click that in SMS to bring in a file, and that's that's on the user uh, guide. But I, I think it's it's important to take a step back and and um, first know how to what what variables to look at and how to calibrate different variables. Um, so looking at the differences between uh, water levels and uh, bed change, they're they're they're, dip, they're calibrated differently. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about post-processing, um, which is necessary for calibration and uh, um, some upcoming features uh, in the CMS. Okay. So again, the, the workshop materials on the SERP website under the Tech Transfer tab and webinars and then uh, advanced topics section. You can get a new version of the of the user's manual with uh, the twentieth, the date of the twentieth, so uh, Tuesday's date, um, from the the SERP Wiki website. Uh, it, it's in the documentation port on the right hand side under downloads. Okay, so let's go. If you go to the uh, user's manual date of the 20th, there's an appendix there that is called MATLAB scripting. I hope, um, well, actually before I start with this, is there any questions on, on yesterday's topics? Especially the, the multiple size sediment transport, um, that's kind of uh, complicated, the most complicated part of the CMS. So if, um, I can also load the PowerPoint presentations to the, the SERP website. We'll have those up uh, this afternoon. Okay, if there's no questions, then I'll, I'll start talking about MATLAB scripting. I hope everybody's familiar with MATLAB. Um, it's uh, all Army Corps employees have access to MATLAB. There, we have a, a site license. If you don't have a MATLAB license and you don't want to buy it, you can also get Octave, which is a, a, a free version of, of, of MATLAB. Um, well, it's not a free version of MATLAB. It's, it's a... It's, it's a MATLAB. It's a, it's a software that that has a programming style very similar to MATLAB, such that you can take MATLAB codes and and run them in Octave. Okay. Um, uh, we we use MATLAB here, and the purpose of scripting um, is, like I said earlier, to set up multiple cases, maybe project alternatives. Um, or to do a sensitivity analysis. If you're starting a project and you want to see how sensitive your results to are to the sediment transport formula or bottom friction or, or turbulence parameters, you can set up multiple cases and, and, and plot them quickly to get an idea of how your results change to those parameters, different values to those parameters. Um, so there's there's a, a few simple steps for for, ma for using scripting. Uh, the first is to set up the multiple cases. Okay, the way you do that is I'm going to go 
to the workshop material, there's a a folder called scripting, and I deleted some of the the folders in there because this is what you would start with when you start a, a you have a new project and you want to set up you want to do scripting. You would have the M files, which you would just copy from here, um, the M, fold, M, M files folder, uh, a base case. So this is a base case is uh, the starting point for your alternatives, um, and then you would modify this one to make your alternatives, and you would just set that up and put that in a folder called base. Um, data sets is any uh, spatial data sets for different alternatives. In this case, the 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 example is for different Manning's coefficients, and so I made several data sets with different values, and I gave them a, gave them a different name, and I stored those in that folder. And then the next step, next step is to make your alternatives. Okay, um, the way you do that is you open the the MATLAB script called setup brick cases. Um, and this is an example, obviously, for, for bottom friction, but you can uh, modify it for your purposes. Okay, the way the logic works here is um, I use a structure variable, okay, R, that has fields with the names of CMS card cards. So there's a card in CMS that's, that's Manning's and data set, another card that's wave current mean stress. Um, and you can imagine this as setting the card value in MATLAB, okay? Um, and yeah, that's how it works. So case one has is is exactly base the base case with these two cards modified, and case two is the base case with these two cards modified. And so what the script is going to do is going to create folder with the case name, case one, case two, case three, and then copy the files and then modify those two cards to create that alternative or, or case. Um, and you can look at the code, it's very simple, it's very short. Um, and you can expand these these uh, options to whatever number you want. You can modify the time step. For example, if I wanted to modify the time step for this case, I would just say hydro time step and then enter the value here. Uh, it is uh, maybe 900, just like that. Um, and then you can run this. So the way I ran it is by hitting F5, but you can run it from here. You can run it from the command prompt. Um, and it's going through all the cases, creating the folders. Um, now I have six cases. Okay. If I looked at if I look at case three. You can see that it modified the time step to 900, or maybe it was 900 already. Um, but that's how it how it works. Um, and then these are the, the the two cards at the bottom. The other two cards, the well, one of them, the, the wave current mean stress. If the the script doesn't find a card to modify, then it it writes it at the end in the advanced section. So now you have those six cases. Um, you're ready to run them and you can set up a, a batch file to run them all together or one right after the other because you may have 30 of them. You don't want to sit around waiting for them to finish. Um, so the way you do that is by opening the MATLAB script called uh, create frick bat. So create the friction that far. That's this one here. And the user input is just the, the bat name, bat file name, uh, the batch file name, the CMS executable, and a num group. This is 
if you have multiple cases, you can run several at the same time in a group. Um, because let's say you you have a, a computer with 16 processors, you can run maybe three at the at, at the same time with two three threads, and then wait for those to finish, and then run run another set another group. And that's what this number is. If you put one, then it's going to run one, and then wait, then run another one. Um, uh, one, one of the organizers here is is, um, is not sure if the districts have licenses to MATLAB or not. But if they don't have access to MATLAB, um, if they don't have licenses, they I know some of the districts do, like Jacksonville District has MATLAB and the Seattle District. If they don't have access to MATLAB, they can use Octave for that. Um, yeah. And this file will create, this script will create the batch file. If I run it, if you open the, uh, the scripting folder, you'll see that it created this run underscore cases dot bat. And I can open that in TextPad to see what it looks like. And it says start. Um, runs this executable, the CMS model, with this input, the card file, with the relative path in front of it. And the wait command um, is just to tell the, it's just so that the, the next CMS model run will not start until the previous one is finished. Because I'm running on this laptop, I don't have that many cores. Um, once that is done, you can just double click on the run cases dot bat and they will all start. But I'm not going to wait for this to, to run. I'm going to kill them all. Um, that's, that's how it works. Is there any questions on, on scripting? Until now, this is really useful for calibrating the model. Um, what I do sometimes is I'll, I'll pick a specific variable to calibrate, and I'll set up multiple cases varying that, and then plot those and limit and do that variable first, and then I'll pick another variable, calibrate that variable, and then move on. Um, versus modifying all of the parameters at once. Because if you just modify one at a time, then at least you can see it's easier to understand. And that's simpler that way. And even then, you can set up multiple, lots of cases for just one or two variables. But yeah, you can do a couple of variables at the same time if they're related. That, that's OK. Is there any questions on scripting? Do people have access to MATLAB? Um, maybe I'm showing this and nobody uses MATLAB except except me. Um, the other thing people can do is uh, you can use shell scripts. Okay, um, so there is there's some folks that use MATLAB and batch files, so that's good. I like MATLAB because it it's like a all inclusive package. You can do almost anything. You can do pre processing, visualization, post processing, um, scripting, lots of things. Um, it's very powerful. And all this is described in the, the, the appendix uh, D of the user's manual. So you can see that in the example here, um, I was modifying the, the time series increment output and um, Manning's end data set. All the extra subroutine uh, MATLAB scripts that you need to do that are included in the workshop material. 
And there's also an example of plotting uh, the time series the, uh, at a save point or observation point. Okay, if there's no more questions on that, then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, calibration. Um, Appendix F has a list or, yeah, describes several goodness of fit statistics that we recommend you use for model calibration. The Breyer skill score is a number between 0 and 1, and it, it's good for variables which you're trying to predict where you have an initial condition, okay? It's not good for, um, for example, the, the current velocities or water elevations because there's, there's no initial condition for that. It's good for bathymetry um, and that's pretty much all we use it for, but you can imagine other variables that have initial conditions. Um, you can use it for those too. Um, there's a similar variable to the, the Breyer skill score, and we didn't include it in the manual, but it's on the, on the SERP website, on the SERP wiki website. Um, let me go there so I can show you. This, I never remember the name because it has such a weird name, the Nash Subcliff Coefficient, which is very similar to the Breyer skill score, except Instead of an initial condition, it uses the mean of the variable. So this statistic can be applied to variables that don't have an initial condition, like current velocities and water, and, uh, uh, water levels. Okay, um, and it has a similar range to the same range as the Barrasco score and some similar, similar quantifications. Um, let's see, I see there's some questions. Uh, Vincent, Mes Vincent is asking if uh, you will receive an attention that you followed the webinar. I'm not really sure what the... what um, you mean by that. Oh, okay. Um, if you're referring to professional development hours, credits, um, the answer is yes. As Mitch mentioned right now, those will, will be sent. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, if you attended the, the basics uh, webinar last week that Mitch Brown gave, I see a lot of the same names as last week. You can also get credits for that webinar. Um, So goodness of fit statistics. The other standard statistics that are, are used are the root mean squared error. Um, we, prefer, we prefer the normalized root mean squared error because if you just give a root mean squared error, it, it doesn't really mean much because it, it, its magnitude depends on the problem. Okay, if, you, if it's a laboratory case, it's going to be a small number. If it's going to be a field case with mild conditions, it's going to be a bigger number. It's a field case with very strong conditions, that's wave and tidal range, um, and the number is going to be bigger. And so it's 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 a good practice to normalize it and use instead the normalized root mean squared error because it gives you an estimate of how much error you have relative to the data range, um, which you can define as the maximum value divided by the mean minimum value. Um, but Different people define the, the, this range differently or, or the, the variable that you normalize your data with. Um, and that's really up to, um, up to you, up, up to the user. As long as you state how you normalize your, your root mean squared error, uh, then it's okay. Um, if you, as long as you state how you did it and why you did it that way, then it's okay. Um, for example, in some cases, 
you only measure part of the data, but you know that there's larger values or minimum values, like wave height. You know your minimum wave height is zero. It's not the minimum value you measured, okay? Because the wave height goes to zero at the shore. So it's okay in the case of wave heights, for example, for example, to normalize by just the maximum wave height, the measured wave height, which would be the breaking wave height. Um, there's other statistics like uh, the mean absolute error, and you can normalize that one too. Uh, the correlation coefficient, which is, gives you an indication of, of how well uh, the, the data can be, how much of the variance between the two variables can be described by a linear fit. Um, I see there's some questions. Okay. Yes, um, as one of the organizers mentioned, some people like to call the normalized relative mean squared error relative um, instead of normalized. Um, that's, that's fine. And then we have bias and a normalized bias uh, statistic too. Um, the, the biases are good for, for hydrodynamic variables. The correlation coefficient is good for um, the, the bed change. Okay, um, and then there's the the normalized root mean squared error is good for hydrodynamic variables also. Um, for bed change, there's lots of other um, things you can do to to, to calibrate the model. Um, there's a, one statistic that people look at, which is the percent. Of the of the time in which you calculated the right trend of erosion or deposition, so you take your your measured morphology change and your predicted morphology change, and you check whether you have the same sign, and then you you calculate the fraction of places where you have the, the correct sign. Okay, so maybe the magnitudes are off, but at least you have the right uh, trend at that site. Okay, because maybe you're not simulating the whole simulation period, right? Or you're missing data for a certain amount of time uh, in between which the, the field surveys for the measured data were, were calculated. So you don't expect the magnitude be, to be correct just because you, you can't model that. But um, at least you can look at the trends, whether you're, you're calculating the erosion and deposition in the right places. Um, for morphology change, something else that's commonly done is to look at volumes. Okay, so the model may predict a shoal uh, in the wrong place, but it's the right volume, and that may be because of the because the model is predicting that the waves break at a slightly offshore location than the field. Okay, because your gamma is off in the, in the wave breaking formulation, different things like that. Um, so looking at volume, shoaling volumes, uh, uh, channel shoaling vo uh, rates, um, ebb shoal volumes, bar volumes, things like that. And so what you do um, is that you, you create polygons in SMS to, to define certain places. Um, and you can calcul calculate the volumes inside of those and compare it to the measured ones. The measured polygon may be slightly off, okay? But you, you can still use them, okay? You can compare this volume to the other volume. As long as you, you explain how you did that in your results, this is perfectly valid, okay? Perfectly valid to do. It's, but you want to use several statistics and methods when you calibrate your model. Um, the the V and V uh, reports, um, which are these, this is one of them, this is the one for sediment transport, has several examples of, of uh, laboratory and field cases where calibration was done and, and, and you can see how these goodness of fit, of fit statistics were applied. This is one example for uh, um, what is that place called? St. Augustine Inlet and Tanya calculated 
uh, bombs within certain polygons and compared the measured and, and predicted uh, values in these tables here. Okay. Um, uh, Fran is asking if I can go over the most important coefficients parameters related to sediment transport uh, from an application and inlet. And thanks for asking that. I, I said I was going to cover that uh, yesterday, um, so I'll, I'll do that now. Let's go to let's go to chapter two, sediment transport. So this is the sediment transport equation that we're solving. I'm going to point out what are the most important uh, terms and as far as the equations mathematically and physics, and then we can go into the user guide, how you change those, and which ones you change first. Um, so the temporal term, advection, diffusion, and the source term. I'll highlight them with this. This is temporal term, advection, diffusion, source term. Temporal term is, is uh, pretty small most of the time. The, the beta, the total load correction factor, this beta, um, it's not a user, it's not a parameter that the user can calibrate. Okay, it's just internal, um, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, it can be important for certain simulations, so you, it's, a, it's good that we have it there, but you don't need to worry about it. Advection is very important. It's the, the main physical process going on, but again, you don't have any things to calibrate there. Diffusion is second order to advection, and then you have one thing to change there, which is the amount of mixing. And you can modify that with the uh, Schmidt number. Um, I'll go into that in the user guide. Um, the default is one. If you, if you think that you have too much mixing, and you'll see that in your results by oh, uh, too much smoothing in, in your initial bathymetry, then you can maybe try increasing the Schmidt number a little bit. But really, it's not a calibration parameter. It's really getting picky. Um, it's, it's a third order. Um, the most important things are, the most important thing is the source term. Okay, the, the concentration capacity is C sub T star K and the alpha parameter, the, the adaptation coefficient. Those two are going to determine where the sediment is moving, how much of it is moving, and how fast it's depositing or eroding. Um, so that's really where the user can, can, can calibrate the model or you, where you should start with. Um, going on to the, uh, so as I mentioned, there's lots of ways to, to specify the adaptation coefficient. The best starting point is a, a constant adaptation length. The reason for this is because it gives you a better idea of what the what the value is. If you select an, uh, an empirical formula, then you don't know what the model is calculating internally. At least if you specify a constant value internally, you, you can relate that to your results. Um, for example, uh, I start off with a, typically a value of 10 for the adaptation length, and then I'll try 5 and 20. And I'll run the model, and if I don't see any uh, sensitivity to that parameter, then I'll move on. If I do, then I'll I'll try more things. Okay, I'll I'll try other formula, uh, maybe calculating separately the bed load adaptation length and the the suspended load adaptation coefficient and weighting them. There's lots of options for the adaptation coefficient. Um, how sensitive your results are going to be to adaptation length, as I mentioned earlier this week depends on the size of your problem and how dynamic it is. If your adaptation length is small relative to your grid length, then what that means is that when the sediment goes from one cell to another, it's reaching equilibrium by the time it gets to the other cell. If your adaptation length is much lar longer than your cell size, then it takes several cells for the sediment to reach equilibrium and therefore your results are going to be more sensitive to that parameter. Um, of course, your cell size is, is, depends on your, the problem that you're trying to simulate. Your, your 
the scale of your problem, right? That's why it's relative to the scale of your problem. If you have a very small inlet where your grid resolution is one meter, uh, you can expect that your 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 results are going to be sensitive to the, the bed change. Yeah, adaptation coefficient. Um, if you have a big estuary or big bay or a large inlet, then your results are not going to be sensitive to the adaptation coefficient. Excuse me for a second. Sorry about that. I had a phone call. Um, okay, so that's the adaptation coefficient. Um, that's one of the parameters that you should start with. Um, the very first parameter that I do is the the uh, total load. No, I'm sorry. The equilibrium uh, sediment transport formula, right? And that's described in section equilibrium concentration and transport rates. And we have several options for that. Um, and using uh, different ones makes a big difference in your results. Um, so I always test them all. Well, except the water not yet. I don't commonly use that one. But at least the Lunserp, uh, uh, Soulsby Van Rijn, and the Van Rijn transport formula, I always try them and compare those results. Um, and then once I, I find the one I like the most, I go ahead and then start doing the adaptation coefficient calibration or sensitivity first. Um, there's also the the suspended and bed load uh, scaling factors, these F sub S and F sub B. If you have field data of, of morphology change, you can calibrate um, how much morphology change you get with these numbers, okay? Because the bigger they are, the more sediment you're moving, the more morphology change you're going to get. Um, so start off with, with the default values and try out the different transport formula with, with scaling factors of one. And you'll get different trends. Pick the formula that you like the trends the most, well, that compares the best with your data, even if the magnitudes are off. Then you can, comp then you can calibrate the scaling factors and the adaptation coefficients. Um, after all that, you can calibrate other parameters. If you're running a multiple size sediment transport, you can calibrate this hiding and exposure coefficient, uh, M, this exponent M, okay? Um, if your results, there's, there's another parameter, this, uh, where is that? The bed slope coefficient, I'm looking for that equation, here it is. This D sub S that we talked about earlier this week, that's kind of a minor, it has a minor influence on your results, so I would leave it until the very end. And What it does to your results is that it smooths out the bathymetry, um, so if you see that your results are too smooth, then you can reduce that if you're having instability problems or you think your results are not smooth enough, which is rarely the case, then you can increase that value. Um, other things, other parameters are even less important, like uh, you know the mixing layer options and uh, bed layer thickness and uh, even Schmidt number is a relatively small inf influence on your results. So that's the order that I recommend for calibrating your, mo your model. Is there any questions on, on model calibration? Um, Um, the survey questions are ready and they're going to be available immediately after the, the webinar and the link to the survey is going gonna, gonna to be uh, resent t tomorrow by email. So you, you can answer them maybe next week or this afternoon. 
Um, one thing is that you want to calibrate hydrodynamics before you start sediment transport. It does, it's not necessary. It doesn't make sense to run sediment transport until you're confident your hydrodynamics is good. Um, maybe there's a problem. It may be that there's a problem with hydrodynamics and you're trying to run sediment transport. The model's crashing and you think it's sediment transport, but actually it's, you know, the problem is maybe a boundary condition in the hydrodynamics because of something weird, you know, a bad bathymetry at a boundary or a uh, great orientation or something like that. So it's always good to start with hydrodynamics and then do sediment transport. Um, for hydrodynamics, um, report number three of the VNV cases has lots of cases uh, with uh, validation of hydrodynamics. Um, one example is this uh, idealized uh, inlet. This example here is the, uh, the Visser Laboratory experiment. Um, and something uh, really important here is the effect of the roller, um, which we talked about earlier this week. Um, the blue line is the, the curve of the Eulongshire current here um, with the roller, and the, the red one is without the roller. And so, so you can see that when you turn the roller on, it moves the, the peak alongshore current closer to the shore because it, it stores the energy from when the waves break and then releases it further closer to shore. Um, and it kind of smooths the, the the longshore current profile too because it's distributing the, the energy, it's releasing it slowly um, or slower. Um, and so it, it makes a big difference in your results. And we see similar uh, similar uh, results for, for field cases like this example here when you don't have a roller and when you include the roller, it, imp it improves the results significantly. This is a, a Duck, North Carolina. Um, you, you see the wave height pattern here and then different results with the roller and without and with different uh, roller dissipation coefficients. Um, again, the roller makes a huge difference in, in, in being able to predict the alongshore current profile. So that's why we recommend to always turn it on even though right now it's not the default. Okay, so you want to change that. Um, and for all of these cases, we show the, the goodness of fit statistics. Um, we, in this case, we calculated the normalized root mean squared error, mean, normalized mean absolute error, the correlation coefficient squared. The reason why people square it is because if you square it, it represents the amount of variance uh, repre uh, represented by a linear fit of the data. Um, and then the bias. Uh, some people like to show the normalized errors as percentages, and that's what we do here. Um, if you're looking at comparing water levels, you can also calculate uh, tidal constituents and compare those to, to gauges. However, you need long simulations to do that, at least a month time series to be able to calculate tidal constituents with any kind of, of accuracy. Um, so for these cases, which was, you know, this one was 200 something hours, it, it's really too short to do that. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Fran is asking if, if, besides the calc roller, if there's any other advanced cards that I include most of the time. Um, let me think about that. Uh, it depends on what forcings I have in the model and <clears throat> if, whether I'm running multiple size sediment transport and such. There's just so many cards. Um, let, let me just start by saying I always use the advanced cards and I always modify my input uh, with a text editor, with, with TextPad or WordPad or whatever. Once I set up my grid in SMS and enter my basic parameters, I'll do everything else in, in, the, uh, in the text editor as far as changing the, the input parameters and such. Um, there's lots of advanced cards, especially for output right now. 
most of the advanced output options are in the advanced cards, and so I always do that. If I want to turn on, if I want to separate the variables into different groups, I do that in the advanced cards. If I, if I want to compress the out, output file, I do that in the advanced cards. There's just so many, uh, so many options. Um, I can't. Uh, let me look at these these cases here. The global statistics. I always turn that on when I'm running the model. That's in the output section. Um, what else? Uh, I I like to put my my steering information inside the card file so later. I can go back and look at what my steering interval was. If I type, if you type the steering interval in the command prompt, you don't have any record of that. Of course, it's in the diagnostic file, but um, you know, if you delete that or overwrite that somehow, um, that's one bad thing about our diagnostic file is that it has that that name that's always the same, and so you can easily overwrite it. Um, so saving this information here is really useful. Uh, there's lots of steering options. There's you have uh, wave extrapolation distance. And that's the same for flow. If you have uh, two grids that are not the same dimensions, um, I just recommend that you uh, read the user's manual and become familiar with it. Um, I also we also talked about the, the wind reference frame. Um, I like to use a Lagrangian reference frame because it's more it's more physically accurate. Even if for some cases it doesn't make a huge difference, I like turning on the bed bed slope friction coefficient. Um, again, it doesn't make a huge difference, but if, if it's more physically accurate, then then I'll I'll turn it on. Um, a lot of output options are done in the advanced cards right now. I think that that's 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 it. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, let me go to this example here. This is one example for Grace Harbor where I ran multiple size sediment transport. And in comparing the, the bed change, the predicted to measured, I made polygons to delineate different areas and that makes it easier to, to position yourself spatially um, when looking at the two figures. Um, I think that's really, you know, for maybe an inlet, this would be like different shoals and such. In this case, it, the yellow area um, is the, the just inside of the bar, and the, the blue area is the, sh the the beach face, the shore face, and then you see these all uh, these beach cusps that are 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 forming intermediate uh, yellow areas, um, and the blue areas is just behind the the, the bar the beach bar. Um, and the statistics that we calculated for this one are for bed for depth we use the, the buyer skill score and for bed change the correlation coefficient. Um, and so I recommend that you look at both the VNV cases, uh, VNV reports, and, and look at, at the examples of how the model was calibrated. Look at the setup. We we put tables describing all the setup for each case. Um, for example, um, this this flume case of multiple size sediment transport. You know, you put all the input parameters there: the water density, the transport formula, the number of size classes, porosity. Every number is there, um, and so you can get an idea of, of what numbers to use for different types of applications. When you, as far as 
problem solving when the model crashes and when it's not running. The first thing I would look at is um, your bathymetry. Most, a lot of times, the, the, the source of the problem is bathymetry. Um, and look at your results. Look at the, the transient solution and see where your, your model is crashing. Um, I get a lot of users that, that say, oh, the model's crashing. I don't know why. And then they'll send me their results. And I ask them, well, did you, did you look at your results? They say, no. Did you try changing the time step or, or looking at your bathymetry or something? No. And everything's no. So they, they give up very easily. Okay. Modeling is not easy. And your model, the model is going to crash. You, you can make it crash very easily by making a mistake somewhere. I make the model crash all the time. Um, it's not that it's a bad model. It's just that all models are like that. If you've used other morphodynamic models, then you're used to it or even other hydrodynamic models. Um, so it's just the nature of, of modeling. Um, you have make mistakes and you need, you need to find them and, and debug them yourself. Um, I, I go as far as making grids for people and changing the set of parameters for them to get started. But um, if I see that, if, if I give recommendations and tell them, you know, fix this bathymetry, change those parameters, do this and that, and then they come back a week later and they didn't do anything then you know then they're on their own but if if you can show that you're you're doing your share of the work too trying to get the model to run I will I will do half the project for you I will make it work I will do anything if it's a model problem okay um, we really uh, spend a lot of our our time doing user support and it's all free Excuse me a second. Um, one other thing you can look at is the wetting and drying problems. Um, if you have a bay where it, you have lots of tidal creeks, um, lots of wetting and drying, a lot of times if the bathymetry is bad, if, if the, the bathymetry is so coarse that the tidal creeks are closed or not, flushing properly, then you can get uh, water ponding because the water can't get out and then eventually it forms like a waterfall. And you get very high flows and unrealistic flow patterns and that will um, cause them all to crash. So sometimes adding more resolution in those places will fix the problem. Um, well, it should fix the problem. Um, or increasing your wetting and drying depth will make the model more stable also. Default is five centimeters, but if you increase that to ten or twenty centimeters, that will usually uh, eliminate the the instability problems. Um, the problem with shallow depths is is not the hydrodynamics; is usually the the wave forcing too. Um, you can have very large wave forcing in very shallow water, and that will cause instability problems. Um, Is there any questions on model calibration? How how to do it? The steps involved. Um, this is really important. Um, and th the same things I'm talking about uh, for CMS would apply to any other morphodynamic model. As far as the importance of the the parameters, um, it's the same order. You know, we're all solving the same equations, and they're, they're they have the same importance in all of them. Um, okay, if there's no more questions on that, then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the post-processing. Um, I'm a MATLAB guy, and so I like to do all my pre- and post-processing in MATLAB. Um, there's a section in the user manual for, uh, for post-processing in SMS. Um, you, can, you can do that. Um, if if you want to do, it, I'm not going to talk cover that 
cover that today because honestly I never do it that way. Tanya likes to do it that way and some users don't have MATLAB, don't care for MATLAB, want to do it in SMS, that's fine. We, 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 we provide you with the instructions on how to do that. But for me, for myself, I don't do it in MATLAB. Um, for example, the section on uh, sediment transport, how to post-process that, um, describes uh, how to calculate transport, oops, there's a T missing here, um, transport roses at observation points. A transport rose is just, let me show you what it looks like, it's this figure. In this case, I only put three, but if you have a complex uh, entrance, you can put as many as you want. You just need to put an observation point before you run your model. So you can make a, a, a rose at that station. It tells you uh, in what directions and how much the sediment transport is moving in. Um, so because this is a channel, you, you expect the sediment to move back and forth. And that's why there's, uh, there's, there's two principal components um, to the sediment transport. But you can put these anywhere you want. Um, and the, the way you get this background image that looks like SMS and MATLAB is by exporting the, an image in, in SMS and reading that in MATLAB. So it's a little trick that I do to make the MATLAB figures uh, look like SMS. Okay? But it's, it's kind of even nicer than SMS because you get your coordinates too, which SMS doesn't give you. Um, so from SMS, you can export a geo-referenced image, which is easy, easily read in MATLAB. Um, that example is, is here. Okay, that's the script here that plots the sediment transport roses. Um, it reads your grid. It reads your transport vectors that, uh, that are saved if you make the observation points uh, if you, if you make observation points with the, the sediment transport uh, uh, selected, output selected, and then the, the background image that you export from SMS, and then that's it. That's all the input to the little script, and it'll, it'll plot a figure like this. And that's really useful for uh, interpreting the model results and, and looking at the sediment pathways, okay? It could be that in some areas, you don't have a, a large set of net sediment transport, but there's a lot of sediment moving back and forth. And this is important uh, for, for projects when you're looking at maybe realigning a channel or you just want to see the, the paths in which the sediment move. Okay? Um, another thing you can do in post-processing sediment is calculating flexes across arcs. And this is useful for calculating, they're not really sediment budgets, but at least sediment balances, like we, we call them, because when we think of sediment budgets, we think of long-term, you know, year, more than a year uh, time scale. Um, and a lot of, or more than that, a lot more than that. And when we run the model, we don't always run uh, that time scale, and it's also calculated, it's not measured, so we, we prefer, I prefer saying sediment balance. Um, for those, you can make polygons and calculate the fluxes in and out of those polygons for control volumes. Um, you can also calculate uh, longshore sediment transport, for example, and that's the example that's described in detail in the uh, user manual. Um, I just realized there's one typo in the user manual when it says the, the units of the output uh, flux, it's, it's actually kilograms per per second, not kilograms. Um, I fixed this and I'll, in the next version of, I, of the draft uh, user's manual, I'll, I'll, um, I'll fix this result. But it's, it's fairly simple. This is one thing that used to take a long time to calculate, but now with the simulation statistics, the, if I show the equation, the simulation statistics basically calculates this part of the equation, and then you only need the SMS to calculate the spatial and uh, the line integration, so it's very fast. Before, 
we had to do both of those integrations in MATLAB and it would take a long time for especially long simulations. Um, so I recommend you always use the, the, the simulation statistics for post-processing results and like I mentioned earlier this week also for improving your initial setup, your, your model setup, improving your grid. Um, um, it's much simpler to look at the statistic than that your transient simulations for improving your grid. Uh, you can get all the important stuff like the maximum current velocities, uh, current uh, residuals, current velocity residuals from those. Um, and the user manual talks a little bit about sediment, about morphology change and how to pro post process that in SMS placing transects and such. Um, the way I like to do it is I will put the, the observational arcs and extract those into files and read those in MATLAB and plot them in MATLAB. Because as you can see here, the, the SMS plotting is really not that great. I mean, it gets the job done, but it's not, you don't have a lot of uh, flexibility in modifying the, the image. Uh, how how it looks. So you can get the images to look a lot nicer in MATLAB. And Tanya describes that here, how to export the data into MATLAB. Uh, well, to an ASCII file. Um, since it's almost 2 o'clock, I'd like to um, kind of wrap this, start wrapping this up and and see if anybody has any additional questions before I go into the upcoming features of the CMS. If there's no more questions, then I'll, I'll go back to my PowerPoint slide here. Okay. The SERP has been working uh, for a while on Swash Zone Sediment Transport, and this figure on the upper right-hand corner is an example for the, the LSTF flume, which is here at uh, Waterways Experiment Station. Um, and you can see in the figure that if you don't include swash zone sediment transport, which is these these are longshore sediment transport rates, if you don't include swash zone, then you underpredict the total sediment the total longshore sediment transport significantly. And so, uh, this has an important implication for for the field when you're comparing the model results to to you know uh, longshore sediment transport rates from literature from sediment budgets, for example. Um, the model, this model, and most morphodynamic models don't include the swash zone sediment transport, and therefore you would expect to underpredict the total longshore sediment transport um, compared to those sediment budget studies. Um, how much you underpredict depends on how big the swash zone is. Um, if your surf zone is very wide, uh, for example, that example that I showed uh, for Grace Harbor, it's a very wide surf zone. You have big waves that um, in those cases, swash zone is, is, is not that big. But if your waves are pretty small and you have a beach break, then swash zone will be the, the, the major component. Okay. Um, in this case, for the LSTF, there was a, a bar where the waves broke, but then the waves reformed and broke again on the beach. Um, and so the swash zone transport was very big. Um, and we're adding that to the CMS. Um, the major major difficulty with swash zone, the swash zone is the incorporating that into a 2D model, um, but we're working on that. We're working on cross shore sediment transport, um, um, the mixed sediments. Someone asked if if the CMS supports cohesive sediments or mixed cohesive and non cohesive, and right now we don't. But we're pursuing two avenues for that. We're incorporating a, a derivative of the sed cell J model which is the model that's in the EFDC and CH3D and other models. 
um, and also our, our own SERP uh, model, the CMS said, um, we're going to link automatically to title databases. Right now you have to use SMS to extract uh, the boundary conditions at the cell strings um, and, and that, that works fine. It's just that for long simulations it can take a while but also if we want to be able to calculate uh, title potentials, um, we need the constituent information at every cell in the grid. And so for that case, it just makes sense uh, for us to, to be able to read those title bases automatically in CMS and get the information we need um, instead of generating time series or, or things like that. Um, one other thing we want to do is automated boundary condition extraction tool. Um, if you have a large model solution and you want to nest CMS with inside that, um, we're making a tool that will automatically, internally extract the boundary conditions for CMS uh, without having to do it, uh, you know, writing separate files or doing it in SMS or something. It just makes it more efficient. Um, and we're working on different forms of parallel parallelization for for HPC, but also using the the, the graphics cards using GP GPU. Um, Especially the parallelization with the graphics cards shows a lot of promise. Um, we hope to have that by the end of the year. Uh, okay. Um, last year we we did a lot of research with multiple size sediment transport. Um, we developed a new formula, um, which is shown on the bottom. Uh, Dr. Wood did that, and we also extended the current Lunser formulas to multiple grain sizes. And the two tables shown here compare those formulas with other formulas um, in literature. Um, for example, the rib rank formula. And you can see that the, our formulas, the Lunser and the Wu formulas, did very good um, in predicting the data, um, the transport rates. Um, we're also compiling a, data, a database of, of, of transport rates and laboratory experiments, and this will benefit uh, the whole lab. Okay, one new thing, too, is this quasi-3 approach, quasi-3D approach. Um, basically, it simulates the vertical variation of the horizontal velocities through the various uh, uh, processes including wind, waves, uh, bottom stresses, helical flow, which is um, like when, you, when you're in a river or when, when you have flow that is, has curvature in it, uh, you, you tend to have this flow pattern. So U sub n is the stream-wise velocity and the, the cross-stream velocity, you have a recirculation. So at the top, the, the velocities are going uh, uh, outward of the outward, yeah, and then toward the bottom, they're going inward. Um, that's what's referred to as helical flow. And it all, we also include uh, Coriolis. Um, and a, the method uses a semi-analytical solution to the vertical velocity profiles. And the advantage of this is that the dispersion and the wave current interaction terms are calculated analytically and you don't need numerical integration. It's very efficient. Um, and this is being beta tested right now. Um, I see there's some questions. Yeah, the uh, The helical flow is a lot of times referred to as secondary uh, circulation um, in conjunction with the Coriolis. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, and so here are, here's one uh, result of the quasi-3D model for the LIP experiments. It's a, it's a Dutch experiment in the, um, was done in the, the Delft flume. Um, so it's a very, very big flume. They can run almost prototype scale uh, waves. Um, 
in this case the wave height was something like 0.8, some uh, in a fraction of uh, the RMS value at least. So a significant wave height was larger than one meter. Um, and here on the left hand side it shows the wave height variation, the water setup, uh, and then the water depth, uh, the, the bed profile. On the right hand side you see the vertical variation of the undertow velocity. And uh, the model does pretty good in predicting the undertow velocity profile. And I think that this is really the key for us to move forward with cross-shore sediment transport. Um, we've been trying to do cross-shore sediment transport in a depth average sense, in, the, in a 2D model, in a 2D model sense, and it, it's limited that way. Um, doing, using a quasi-3D model just includes a lot more physics, and I expect that it'll make a huge difference in the sediment transport. Hydrodynamics, not so much. The, the effect of the, the vertical variation of the velocity profiles on the hydrodynamics, like the setup, longshore current, and such, it's not that uh, imp important, well, less important um, than for sediment transport, where it really is going to make a difference is for sediment, tr sediment transport. So we're, I'm looking forward to this. Um, can improve our capability significantly. CMS Wave is also working with swash, the swash zone um, and uh, adding wave calculations at complex structures. Um, the CMS Flow, we are at also adding, uh, we are be beta testing, uh, well, not beta testing, we've had the capability to simulate structures for quite some time, but we haven't released it because um, the, the I.O. hasn't been ready, and also we haven't had enough cases to, to validate, uh, field cases to validate the structures with. But um, we have, we're working on a couple of CHTNs for that, and, and the, the code has been verified. We know that the code works. We just haven't had enough field cases to validate with. Um, and then and the new SMS 11.1 is is going to have a lot of new features, um, more input capabilities for for the, the hydrodynamics. The, uh, it's going to have uh, improved time control options to specify the matrix solver. The harmonic boundary condition is going to be there. Um, one really cool thing is the, the grid smoothing. Until now, we haven't been able to smooth uh, telescoping grids, and that's going to be available in, in, in 11.1. The flow tab is now going to include uh, the options for the wave flux velocity, uh, so and the surface roller uh, flux. Um, it's going to have the the different models and coefficients for the, the turbulence, for the eddy viscosity, and uh, for bottom friction, you, you're going to be able to choose. Uh, the wave current bottom boundary layer model or the, the method to estimate the, the, the mean bottom shear stress, basically. And you're going to be able to turn on and off the friction coefficient. And for wind, until now, you in the interface you can only specify time series, uh, so spatially constant winds. And we're going to add the capability to, to, to input uh, spatially variable winds and also use weather stations. So you put different weather stations, each with, with its own time series of, of winds, and then the model will interpolate from those. So lots of cool things coming coming into the interface. Uh, the output, this this is, how, is changing a lot, the output tab. We're adding this, the statistics. Um, you're going to be able to turn on and off different variables of different variable groups um, because some people complain, oh, there's too much output or I want more output. I want this variable that's not turned on. And right now you can do that all in the advanced cards, but it's going to be added to the interface in 11.1. Um, that's basically it for, for the interface and also this webinar. Is there any questions?
w William is asking, in the current version of SMS and CMS, can you provide specially variable wins uh, using advanced cards? So, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, it, it is through the advanced cards. You, you can enter them in the interface or in a text editor, but the, the cards are there. They're described in the user manual, um, chapter 4, hydrodynamics, wind and atmospheric uh, forcing. So it starts off with the S, how the interface looks now and the spatially constant winds, but then it goes into spatially variable winds and all the options that you have. There's two main formats, the single MET file or single wind and atmospheric pressure file, which is equivalent to the ASRIC uh, port.22 format with NWS6. And there's also the ocean weather format. And these are input in the advanced cards. There's examples in the user manual. And there's also example, there's an example of the ocean weather format in the workshop material. Um, Fran is asking if you use XMDF compression, does this affect how quickly SMS can read it? Um, I think that's an, a question for Alan. I'm not, I, I haven't noticed. Um, Alan Zindo, which is the president of Aquaveo, which developed, uh, which developed the SMS. I haven't noticed any, any differences in the time it takes for SMS to load it, but maybe Alan can answer that. See that he's on the line. Or another um, organizer, has anybody seen? Um, can anybody else help answer this question? We can easily test this and see. Um, I usually don't have to use uh, the file compression because I like separating my output into, into different files and so the file sizes are quite manageable. Is there any other questions? So please uh, take the time to answer the, the survey for the webinar. Again, I apologize, this, this webinar, advanced webinar, wasn't very visually interesting. We'll do another webinar where we show lots of animations and show and tell. But I wanted, I wanted to do it this way. I, I'm not sure if the the length of the webinar was was good. If a five day webinar is 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 good for everybody or the time, if you can give us some recommendations on the length of the sim, of the webinars, that would be good. Um, if you prefer that we. Um, do more hands-on, or if we discuss our experiences with the CMS or how to problem solve, please let us know. Um, Matt Schultz is asking, can you have a boundary cell that goes dry in a coupled CMS wave and CMS flow application? Um, yes, the answer is yes. Um, that happens all the time. Our, our boundary conditions have to go, let, let me show that in, in, um, in this example here. So this is a, a CMS flow grid. What is wrong with my screen? 
and if I select my cell, my cell string, you can see that it goes all the way up to land. And that's what you want. And so as the tide goes up and down, some of these cells are going to dry, and that's fine. The model is going to handle that perfectly fine. It'll just detect that that cell string is that cell is dry and it won't apply any, apply any forcing at that cell. Also, feel free if you have any, if you can't think of any questions now and you you, you think of them later, please uh, feel free to email us, us email us with the, the questions. We're usually pretty good about answering questions quickly. Um, and you can send them to the whole group. That's that's better than sending them to just a single person. Um, if that person uh, is maybe out of town or on vacation or on TDY, um, if you send it to the whole group, we can, uh, one of us will answer it and then the answer will go to everybody else and we all know that that person has, his question has been answered. Um, so it, it helps us keep track of the, 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 the questions from the users. Um, and internally we also learn about of the CMS. This way. Is there any other questions? The web meeting software, the go to meeting software does not like SMS. It's it's I go to the PDF file and it looks okay. Is there any other questions? Um, if there's no more questions, then I think we can end the, the webinar now. Um, please fill out those, those survey questions and um, we appreciate your comments and suggestions. I hope that you, you uh, like the, the webinar. Um, if you would like even uh, if you, you would like for me to cover a specific topic that I didn't cover today, please request that. I can do another webinar later. Um, yeah, please give us your, your suggestions. But if there's no more questions, and I think we can end the webinar. Thank you all for, for attending. Um, And I hope you have a good afternoon and a nice weekend. Thank you, everyone. Bye.